Thank you all for tuning in to this student Q&A about the 2020 election. I'm James Pindle. I'm a political reporter at the Boston Globe. Today's discussion will be based off pre-submitted questions we have received from students about the election and what we can expect in the next couple of weeks, even after the election. But before we jump in, I'd like to introduce Jislyn Ngunu, the Vice President of Nellie Mae's Strategy and Programs, who will start us off with some opening remarks. Thank you, James. Um, thank you. I feel so honored to be here, and I want to thank the Globe for hosting this engagement. To everyone listening, to the panelists, and especially to our young people, thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope everyone is doing as okay as anyone possibly can in the trying times that we are in. Uh, the Nellie May Education Foundation one of our values is putting youth at the forefront. So we are really thrilled to be supporting an event that looks to lift up the voices of young people at this critical moment. Uh, young people, we are really grateful for you. We are inspired by you and we are so in awe for the many ways in which you are exercising your voices and power. Although our younger leaders cannot yet vote, we know just how instrumental they have been in the fight for racial and social justice. Young people are leading rallies across the country to demand justice for black lives. They are successfully organizing for police free schools and for curriculum where their identities and cultures are recognized and celebrated and doing so much more. So this year's election will have profound effects on the lives of so many young people, especially our young people of color. And I hope that we will not only consider the questions here today, but work in solidarity with young people to ensure that their futures are ones that are more just, equitable, and fair. They deserve nothing less. Individually and collectively, we have so much work to do and so much to answer. So I'm going to turn it back over to James and our amazing panelists to take us into discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, and thank you for your support on this. Uh, this should be a really interesting few, uh, few minutes here. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel for today's discussion. Since I'm the only guy that stands out, I'm James. Uh, I'd like to introduce, we have an all-female uh, national political reporter, Washington Bureau, and we have two of them here today. One of them is Liz Goodwin. Um, maybe really raise your hand. She's the deputy uh, Washington bureau chief for the Boston Globe, along with national political reporter Jasmine Igea. Um, if you would, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you're watching this and you're watching it live, maybe not recorded, but if you're watching this live, if you have questions that come up uh, during this discussion, we want them. We want to answer them. This is really about you and your opportunity to get your questions in and learn a little bit more about the process. Uh, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You probably know Zoom better than I do. Um, I'd like to start a little bit with an overview about where exactly we stand. We're reporting this exactly uh, one week from Election Day. Jasmine, all signs appear to be pointing to a Biden win. What are the most convincing signs uh, that this is actually happening? No, I think a lot of people aren't convinced that this is actually happening. People right. are super worried. That's why worried. I want to start there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Democrats are especially anxious after 2016, looking at the polls. Um, there's, I think there's hope in, in, for, for people for, for who, who are Biden supporters in that he, he is doing so well in the polling uh, that the coronavirus, that Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic is crashing against reality uh, uh, for a lot of people. You know, he's saying it's over, that, they, they, it, that, it's, that we're, we've rounded the co corner as a, as a country, but for a lot of families, that's just simply not true. They're struggling to make ends meet, especially black and Latino families have been hit especially hard by this. Um, there's been another issue of his was, was immigration coming into the el election, um, it, you know, coming in, into the presidency in 2016, and a lot of people's views on that has changed. Have changed. Uh, there's been a racial reckoning in this country, and I think uh, a lot of, of the attacks, a lot of the racist attacks he used in his first presidential run, aren't resonating with people in the same way that he thinks they are. 
Liz, I want to go to you. I mean, then all signs are pointing to a Biden win, but as Jasmine correctly hedged there for a little bit, uh, walk us through a scenario where Trump can win. Yeah, I mean, so I completely agree with Jasmine. I don't think that um, Democrats feel overconfident, which is really insane, because if you look at the just data, like objectively, there's no other race, I think, in American history where people wouldn't see those indications and be like, oh, Democrats are going to win. Like, I mean, his like Trump's approval rating, um, the polls, the district level polls, the state level polls, the national polls, the early voting data uh, in some key states. There's a lot of stuff that looks so bad for Trump. But I think 2016 taught Democrats, especially to the point that they're traumatized, but taught everyone, all of us, that um, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I think of a way that Trump, a path to victory for Trump could be um, that he somehow holds on to Pennsylvania, for example. I'm in Pennsylvania right now. And um, I think the national, I mean, the average of state polls have him up here, maybe five points. I'm not exactly right. sure. Um, and that's, that's right. actually smaller than his national lead by a lot, right? And maybe there's a polling error there. Maybe um, maybe a lot of the mail-in ballots um, get there, you know, too late, the whatever. There can be a lot of um, a lot of things that can happen in Pennsylvania, varying from him having more support here than, than the polls show to the fact that people are using these new voting methods in this state that has no early voting tradition whatsoever, um, and and the perils that come with that. So yeah, he could hang on to Pennsylvania, hang on to Florida, um, and win. Right? Like, isn't that true? I'm I'm. You're probably better at the numbers than me, but I think he could just. He could he could do the same thing he did last time and lose Wisconsin and Michigan and win, right? Yes. So that, um, that's he could. completely possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of focus on Pennsylvania. We, I don't know how much we want to get into Pennsylvania for a broader audience, but it is going to be, I do think, the obsessive state for all of us, <laughs> particularly post-election, where a lot of the lawsuits will be based. Look, there are three ways that Trump could still win despite all the metrics. Um, but I, let me preface it by saying this, you know, uh, we have a hurricane apparently coming towards Louisiana. Um, when it comes to hurricane season, you know, there's like that cone of probability, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it, you know, the, the hurricanes here. It could go any range. I don't know how this is working on Zoom. You can go to any range of places, but every day that gets closer to land, that cone of probability gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, we're one week out. So the, when I say these three ways that he can win, the probability of that happening obviously gets tighter. One would be that something happens that's actually dramatic, a real October surprise or not a surprise, something positive. For example, um, let's say there's a vaccine that could be announced uh, tomorrow, today, this afternoon. Clearly that's going to be helpful and he tries to claim credit for it, it can be helpful. Second could be some sort of stimulus package from the government, but that seems like that's not gonna happen <laughs> before election day. Um, the one he has been stressing for the last two or three weeks is trying to make Joe Biden uh, less likable. Uh, you've been obviously going off on him. You can get into the weeds on this, the attacks on this on uh, Hunter Biden, for example. But the interesting thing, if you look at the polling, is that uh, Joe Biden's favorability numbers, whether people like him or not, in the polling has actually gone up uh, in the last few weeks. That's probably no small part due to the fact that Joe Biden has raised a lot of money and is spending a lot of money on ads saying that, you know, he's the, he likes ice cream and so do you. Um, so that's probably one big reason. And then third way he could win is sort of driving out, uh, you know, uh, non-college whites. Uh, that's what sort of his base in 2016. Here's one of my biggest questions. And I, I want to ask what, you, what your biggest questions are about the next week. It's that, and my wife is, a, is sick of me talking about this. I'm a little obsessed about the small point. And I don't know how to put on a metric. But Democrats have been so effective in getting in the early vote. Um, you're seeing historic levels of voting uh, that there's a lot of pressure on Republicans to do everything perfectly well on election day itself to drive out their vote. And I think we're all seeing signs that this is going to be a really high record-breaking turnout. Uh, one estimate from a very smart person who looked at this out of, out of the University of Florida suggests that we're going to have the highest voter turnout since 1908. And if that is the case, um, then you may have these like massive three or four hour 
long lines for Republicans to vote because they didn't vote early. And will they show up? Yes, they will show up. Will they stand in line for three or four hours? Most will. But what if like 5% don't? They decide to, you know, forget it. I'll come back later. This is not going to work out. That could have a humongous impact. Um, so there is possible, but clearly all signs are certainly pointing towards a win. Um, I want to talk a little bit about younger voters, uh, given our audience. Um, Liz, you know, we had a, a Harvard poll out this week um, that shows that uh, among 18 to 29 year olds, um, interest in voting is the highest that it's ever been since they began polling 20 years ago. Um, now 63%, again, in that cohort of 18 year olds to 29 year olds, 63% say they will definitely be voting. Uh, what do you think is driving that? Yeah, I think um, young people getting involved in this process is like a, a bright spot. Like sometimes I feel like we don't talk about good news that much in this crazy year. And I think what you're talking about with the high turnout is to me, it's like very inspiring, not just young people, but just in general that we're in this moment of like, where voting itself is a health challenge for, for some people, um, depending on the method you use. And people are just determined to have their voices heard. And it looks like enthusiasm is up across the board, Republicans, Democrats, independents, but just the fact that everyone's actually voting is I think like an actual happy thing that we should highlight right now and that we're going to smash turnout. I think that's great. Um, and with young people, I mean, I think like, look, look at what's happening right now. Like if you were gonna go to college this year or next year, now you're, you're maybe not um, able to go to college. Like your whole life is, especially for people in like a transition phase of their, their life where you don't already have a job, you don't already have something stable that's not being affected by this. Um, you're just in such flux. And I think like, you know, climate change has been a huge issue for young people. Um, and there's gun control too. Gun control, yeah, I was gonna say gun huge. control. <laughs> yeah, people being afraid of, you know, getting shot. And so there's been all these different entry points for young people to get involved and get enthusiastic. Um, and I, one odd thing about this election is actually, um, so in the early vote data that um, that is being analyzed, they're seeing a lot of these first time younger people participating and those people are skewing democratic. They're also seeing a lot of first time older people or not first time, but older people over 65 who sat out the last election who are voting this election. And those people are skewing democratic. And you could have this like interesting coalition of like 21 year olds and 66 year olds um, who are part of a blue wave um, in, you know, next Tuesday. And I think that's, that's really, you know, with all the kind of like, okay, boomer and, and that tension between generations, I think it would be interesting if that ends up playing out in, you know, places like Florida. Yeah, I, right. I'd say there was a, I'd also add that there was a poll that just came out today looking at Latino voters, at young Latino voters, and the primary motivating factor for a lot of those um, voters is ra the, the racial reckoning, you know, wanting to talk more about race, racism, and how we handle race relations in, in the U.S. We continue on with that, Jasmine. I mean, the, the, the and I want to get to some questions we have very soon, um, but I want to dive a little bit more into that. Um, we've heard about all these different subgroups, um, suburban women, which I know I have a colleague working on now, on particularly among women of color near Atlanta. Um, we hear about seniors. Uh, they're the only group that's seen, a, I mean, while the young, the younger vote has been uh, voting more, uh, the only group that's actually changed their minds on how they're feeling about Donald Trump has been seniors. So the senior group has been very, very fascinating. But then there's also these really, really interesting subplots, uh, particularly among Latinx voters, uh, black voters on not just, you know, how they're going to vote, because um, particularly men in those two subgroups are like by single digits. You follow this more than I do, Jasmine, but uh, by single digits are moving towards Donald Trump in, in very, very subtly. Um, there's been a difference between men and women on that. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how the vote among people of color uh, may be the most key element of this election. Uh, sure, there's a, there, there's like a, there's long been a problem with Biden with his en enthusiasm gap, particularly among young and black Latino voters. There's just like, there, there, there hasn't been that kind of energy and excitement for him. 
Um, but I think we're really starting to see that change as, as we're seeing the, these historic numbers, uh, you know, this, these historic turnout, this historic turnout in a lot of, a lot of places. Um, I think a lot, of, uh, another thing that's happening a lot in, in Black and Latino communities is disinformation campaigns have been very, very strong and really very, very targeted, mm. particularly at Spanish speaking voters. Um, and, and it's being targeted at, at older, at an, an, at an older generation that is not accustomed to talking about racism or, or, or race. And, and it's increasingly coming from right wing groups in, in Latin America, where these types of conversations are also taking place. And there's been a rise in these author, authoritarian re regimes. So it's kind of all cross pollinating. Um, and it's and you know, I've been talking to young activists who have been, you know, in this intergenerational ideological warfare where they're with their own parents over this stuff, because it's, it's happened so quickly. It's for some, for some, uh, for some uh, young people, it's happened within a couple of months uh, since the coronavirus shutdowns, uh, the, since the coronavirus shut down all sorts of public life and sent more people to, to computer screens. Um, they've, they've had more time to be digesting this stuff and it's, it's, it's really altered people's perceptions on this. So there's a worry about what that's going to mean in the polls, like if this, especially among the Latino vote, because we, we have more than 32 million registered Latinos. It's, going, it's expected to be the largest uh, voter block of people of color. Um, and, uh, and so if, if there's a split in, 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 in that vote, particularly among older and, and younger voters that, that could tilt, uh, it's, it, that could mean, you know, that could swing a lot of swing states, particularly like Arizona and Florida. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one thing that's gonna be, we've had all this focus, um, in 2017, like the year after Donald Trump won, about what's white working class voters think, what are they thinking? Um, you know, how can Democrats appeal to them? I think they're missing the story of changing America. I think it's more likely uh, that Biden wins Arizona by more than he wins Wisconsin, uh, that he wins Texas by more than he wins Ohio, um, just because of the changing demographics. And I think people are missing the bigger story which I know you've been documenting quite well. I wanna to get to some questions here from students. Um, we have one pre-submitted question from E. McCann. I don't know what E is for an Emily or an Eric. I don't know what it is, it's E. McCann, um, and, but it was a good one. So I wanna make sure I include it. Uh, when will we know who wins on election night in 2020? <laughs> uh, that's the question that we all wanna know. Um, uh, and further, like what happens, uh, I guess this is the second question, uh, what happens if something happens to one of these candidates um, uh, between now and say Tuesday, uh, and you someone early voted, you know, last week? Like, how, how does that play out? Let's take with the first one, Jasmine. Who? When will you know who's actually going to win this sucker? There's been so many scenarios. People have been gaming this out in so many ways. I mean, it, it could be really close, and we we might not know for weeks, especially as some of these states aren't going to begin counting until that very day. We might have somewhat of a narrative, somewhat of an idea, because you know, three states in particular. I think it was Arizona, Ohio. Maybe he'll be out with Florida. Oh, North North Carolina, Florida. North, that that are going to start counting ahead of time. Um, so, particularly like Arizona is going to start counting days and days. So some couple, I think they've they've already started counting some of those early votes. So we might have a sense, especially you know that that could be a good state to look at because of all the dynamics of you have the changing demographics there, you have the seniors who've turned around away from Trump, you have this young energized Latino population there, um, a lot of black voters as well. Uh, so, so you'll see, so that could be a good state to watch that, that might give us a hint of what, what, what do you think Liz, are we going to, are we going to have a, are we going to, Liz, are we going to have a, a, a presidential, a president elect by Thanksgiving? We're going to be arguing about that oh. over our dinner table. <laughs> our our, our, uh, our non-dinner table, because Thanksgiving's also canceled because of COVID. Sorry. True, true, true. Yeah. If I had to guess, I um, would say that we are going to know um, who won. I don't know if, like, everyone will have accepted that or how it's going to play out. Like, it might actually end up being to where, like, the Electoral College has to vote before you know, say Trump loses, like before he would accept that or whatever. But mm -hmm. I think, um, I think that like the, we're, like the outlets are actually going to be able to project a winner um, on election night. I know that's a crazy thing really? to say, but well, because that is a, that is a contrarian take. I think it's going to be a blowout. Decided, I've no, decided go for it. I love it. 
I'm yeah, I'm just doing it. I've decided to kind of believe the polls and I think because I have nothing else to go on. And so I think if the polls are right, you would know because um, I think like Florida and Arizona and North Carolina would tell the story. Um, and so, or, you know, maybe they don't call it, but it's pretty obvious. And then they can call it a few days later um, once the slower counting states officially report. I think we're gonna, it's gonna be obvious personally, but you don't know, it could be really close. It could go on for weeks. I think the Trump campaign has made really clear they're gonna battle every ballot. Um, and I think the Biden campaign is certainly, you know, they've kind of learned from Bush v. Gore uh, and they would not be like, you know, accepting some kind of defeat. Um, they're gonna fight for every ballot too. So it could end up being like legal trench warfare for weeks. And I think all of us are trying to be very cognizant of that and we want you guys to know that too and not feel like things are really scary or crazy if there's not a winner on election day like we're used to because this is just a different election where so many people are voting by mail in just this unprecedented way. So it's not weird if we don't know. I just am being a contrarian and have decided that we will know, but um, that's not necessarily the case. This is why we get along with Liz. I'm a big contrarian. I'm gonna go with you on this a little bit, but here's why. Okay. Um, I am open-minded. Number one, as you, I just wanna reiterate what you just said. Uh, in most presidential races, the winner is not actually declared or no one concedes that night. That's very rare. Uh, even Hillary Clinton didn't actually concede till, till later because um, it was unsure and he accepted you know, the presidency at whatever morning at time in the morning. Um, however, uh, because of what Jasmine was saying earlier, there are three states that can tabulate quite well. The one state I am, I think we should all just be focused on election night uh, is Florida. Um, Florida has the, in 2018, in the last election, had the highest number of voting by mail of any state on the East Coast uh, versus some, you know, West Coast states that do this a lot. So they have a lot of experience in this. So it's just a matter of volume. Um, so I do think we're gonna have a good sense of Florida. If we have a good sense that Florida is certainly going in Biden's way, uh, Trump's way, it would, it would be less clear about where this election is going. But in, if it goes clearly in Biden's favor, and he's up, you know, it's tightening, but he's up about five points uh, in Florida. If he's up then, that means that Biden only needs to flip one more state and, he's the, and he'll have the, the needed 270 votes and the electoral college. So if, if you're looking on election night and it's, you know, let's say 1130 at night, and obviously everyone's going to bed because they have remote learning the next day. Um, but uh, if, if it's clear that Florida is going one way, you're going to hear everyone on TV saying, you know, Biden just needs to flip one more state out of these remaining six or seven where he has a lead in all the polls. Uh, he just needs a, a Wisconsin, uh, an Arizona. You just pick it uh, just by the math. So that's the, that's the scenario that's most likely. Again, if Trump wins, it's a state he won earlier. Uh, the election is not called. Uh, we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. He's got a narrower path to 270. Um, I want to get to a, another question that was brought up a little bit earlier. So uh, what does happen exactly if Trump doesn't accept the results of this election? Does anyone uh, game, want to game this out? I had to write a whole story about this. Um, I know. <laughs> one of our lovely editors. So I guess I'll take this one. Um, yeah. yeah. So basically, there, there's like a constitutional process for deciding who won an election. So there's nothing really special about a concession speech. There, the idea of conceding is not in the law. It's just something that we do as like a nice formality, like how, you know, it's just, it's nice for the outgoing president to attend the inauguration of the incoming president because it shows that we're all on the same page about this is a democracy and we share power and it's peaceful. Um, but it's not like that's in the constitution, the, the president, does not have to attend. The outgoing president does not have to attend. So it's the kind first of like, president, uh, for, the first president from Massachusetts, John Adams, did not attend Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. A historian brought that up to me. So he was like a sore loser, I guess. Um, yes. But <laughs> yeah, but usually they do. It's like a definitely in modern times they've all attended. And but this is an election where you could totally imagine if Trump loses, he doesn't attend, right? Like. Um, this is kind of the first time you could see some of those norms breaking down, but that has nothing to do with someone becoming president on, you know, whatever it is, January 20th, 
2020. There's a day it's set in the constitution. That's when the new president takes office. So the, the place where things could get hairy is just that Trump has really um, stated that he will fight and his campaign, they will fight over these votes. They want any ballots that come in late to be thrown out, even if they were put in the mail at the right time by the voter, it doesn't matter. They're thrown out if they get in late. That's their position in all of these states. And that those kind of disputes over counting and ballots could drag out for a long time. And we could get to the point where you just have to go through the whole process that we're not used to seeing as Americans. We just kind of tune it out, but it happens every four years, no matter what. No matter what, the state certifies the results, the electoral college meets and they have to vote. Congress has to approve it. Like there's a whole process that happens that we just kind of tune out because we already know who won. Um, and that will be interesting this year if that's something that actually we have to watch and see what happens um, and see how much the candidates are fighting it um, but it, that would only happen if it's a very close election, um, in my opinion. And that's in December when the Electoral College meets. Uh, Jasmine, we have any other questions about whether, I mean, what's the likelihood that, you know, we saw Amy Coney Barrett be sworn in last night. And I guess again today, you have to be sworn in twice. Um, uh, what's the likelihood that this goes all the way to the Supreme Court? Or is this a blowout? What, if, if what goes to the Supreme Court? Sorry. The election. So somehow yeah. in a, a, a key lawsuit that could decide the election like Bush v. Gore uh, 20 years ago, which of course no, no high school student watching was alive for. Um, but uh, I'm just dating myself. Um, but uh, what's, the, what's the chance that something like that could actually go to the Supreme Court, which is something that some people- I mean, I think about. Liz has looked at this as the legal challenges more than I have, but I, I'd say it's pretty likely. <laughs> It, it, it's that, a, that, that the Supreme Court could decide this or that the Supreme Court will decide uh, that, that, it could, that, that, that one of these cases will go to the Supreme Court. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I well, agree. A number, I number, a number, number of them already have. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I do think it's less likely that the Supreme Court would decide the actual election. I think a lot of things would have to fall in place. Like one scenario could be Pennsylvania. Like you could imagine... Um, it just splits down the middle and Pennsylvania is, and there's a legal challenge and that would be really nuts. Um, so you just, every, I think for the health of the country, we should all pray for like not a close election. <laughs> right. Basically, Cause I think it, it needs to be clear either way or it's gonna be very ugly. Yeah, and that's something we really looked at looking at our voter suppression project. That was like what election official after election official in states across the country said. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk a little bit, Liz, about Pennsylvania? Why is it such an interesting state right now? And why could it be a really interesting state after the election? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things we were looking at with Pennsylvania when we did our project on voting is just that this is one of these states that has like no tradition of early voting at all. They don't have days before election day where you can go in person and vote. Um, and they really haven't big, big absentee mail-in voting at all. And so this this year for the first time, they're getting a lot of absentee ballots and there's just been tons of ugly court challenges over it. You know, the Trump campaign suing and saying you shouldn't be allowed to have ballot drop boxes. Biden campaign or Biden Democratic lawyer saying like, no, we need drop boxes. And it's just been kind of ground zero for a lot of these really confusing legal challenges about the actual act of voting. Um, and I think that's gonna continue. There's a Republican legislature here, but a Democratic governor, and they've clashed over this voting. And that's a dynamic that could continue after the election if it's coming down to Pennsylvania. Um, and then just generally, it's interesting because it has a lot of the dynamics that are, make this election interesting. It has you know, the suburban women around Philadelphia who've been turned off by Trump um, getting really activated. It has, you know, huge swaths of rural area, which is just one giant Trump flag, you know, like so much enthusiasm for him in the small towns and rural areas. It has the Western part of the state that's really like the Midwest with the kind of crumbling factory towns where people are upset about jobs leaving. And then it has Philadelphia proper, very diverse city. Um, it's just got like kind of everything as a state. Uh, there's a really good piece in the Inquirer showing the kind of diversity of the state mm -hmm. this, this week that I loved. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, 
And then also it's uh, Biden's hometown, Scranton. And so he's been really pushing that because Pennsylvania flipped from Democrats to Republican in 2016. And Biden's really trying to get it back in the, the Democratic column. I think it's been the state he's visited the most too. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. which I think both, um, I think he went like 11 times or something. NBC like counted it up yesterday because he just hasn't been doing a lot of travel at all, but it's so close to where he lives in Delaware. Right. He just comes over even during COVID and has very, very small events. And that's where his national campaign is actually based is in Philadelphia. Um, you know, we had a question from Ann Bennett that expands upon that about what's going on with this blue wall. Jasmine, you want to take that? Um, in terms of why is Biden doing better uh, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania than Hillary Clinton did? I think it's a lot of the things we've already talked about, the, the coronavirus pandemic becoming a reality for, for people. Um, the, I, I think also, I mean, sadly, it's, he's, he's a white man. And I think that that's made a difference with a lot of voters. Um, and I think a lot of people are just fed up uh, with with Trump. You know, I was I was in Michigan, uh, you know, around impeachment, and people were had already turned tuned out the impeachment process because they they'd made up their mind that they were already tired of of a Trump. And some of these were Republican uh, voters, longtime Republican voters. Um, so I think you know he he won by such a a thin margin there. I think it was more than eleven thousand votes in in Michigan alone. So these so he, he doesn't have to do, he didn't have to do much. <laughs> um, and, and it seems like he's, he's really pulling through there. Um, I, what I think is more interesting though, is like, I, you know, I've, I've long been thinking about what's going to be the next blue wall for, for, for the Democrats. And I, I, I'm really wondering about what's going to happen in that, in, in the Southwest, because yes. there's a lot of talk about you know, Arizona, it's been purple for a really long time. It's already, it's gone through its own kind of racial reckoning, uh, its immigration rhetoric. It's, it's seen it's, this, this immigration rhetoric that we saw from Trump. We've seen it on that state and local level with SB 1070, which were, you know, rules kind of profiling that, that a lot of people said led to profiling of Latinos. You had, you know, Sheriff Joe Arpaio creating these un, you know, unhumanitarian uh, camps for, for, for Latino immigrants. So we we we've seen a lot of those, re, and then he loses re-election, which is kind and of. And then he premise. lost his re-election. They've lost the mm -hmm. Republicans have lost their super majorities. They've sent um, a, a, a Democrat to to the Senate. So it's just like it's it's there's a lot of really interesting things going on there in Texas, which you know for you know it's really hard for me as a Texan. I'm from a, a bus, so it's really hard for me to 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 uh, look at you know to believe that Texas could it's could amazing. turn blue because I've been hearing hearing it for like 20 years, but. <laughs> Um, if, 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 if the, the, the dynamics are definitely there. Um, and again, all that area is, is changing demographics. You're having California progressives moving in, chasing affordable housing in this area. You have people from the Midwest who have lost jobs in manufacturing and streaking warm weather moving in. So it's really becoming uh, what, the, what the Midwest used to be, which is that reflection of, what, what, of America, like what, what the demographics look like. I can imagine that there's um, some students that watching this thinking, man, I wish I could be Liz or Jasmine. Can you just briefly talk <laughs> about how you, how you got into becoming a, a political journalist, particularly one that is at this level? You want to start, Liz? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I, I always wanted to be a journalist, actually. Like, I found, I found a diary that I kept when I was in, like, fourth grade, and it was like, when I grow up, I want to be a journalist and live in a big city. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even know where I got the big city from. Um, I'm also from Texas, actually, but, um, and, but my grandpa and my granny were actually both journalists, also in Texas, in North Texas, and, um, my granny wrote like true crime stories for a weekly magazine that was all true crime. And she wrote it under a male pen name. Uh, her name was Geraldine and she went by Jerry. And uh, my grandpa was like, uh, he was like in the war for a bit and he came back and he would write um, breaking news kind of stuff for, the, uh, for this newspaper. Um, and then he eventually became an editor there. And they just always seemed to have like a really fun life and it seemed very cool. So that's how I got into it. Um, but yeah, I like worked 
Yeah, that, that's what inspired me. But then it was kind of an inglorious route to, <laughs> to this job. <laughs> Definitely like, uh, you know, just kind of, I remember I had to do an internship at the New York Sun and it, and we were all vying for this one job. They were going to give the interns like one job out of like seven as a, of us. It was like wow. the Hunger Games. And um, I didn't get it. And I was like devastated. This other guy got it. And then like two months later, the newspaper went out of business. Done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? Joke's on it? you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's a really, it's true. It is a really cool job. It's cool. We get to do it. Um, I, I started, I got into journalism. I worked at, I, I wrote for the high school paper and I, I think my, my, my origin story was I, I wrote, a, I started looking at the disappearances of women across the border from my hometown, uh, in Ciudad Juarez, because I'm from El Paso, the Western tip of Texas. Um, and again, my grandmother also played a pivotal role there because it was actually she who was driving me to the colonias of a lot of the, like the, the, na the neighborhoods where women had gone missing. Um, and she always wanted me to be a lawyer. <laughs> she wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor. So <laughs> now every time she's, you know, she, she kept asking me right into my twenties, like, are you going to go to law school yet? I'm like, but grandma, you played such a pivotal role in why I became a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so, but again, it was also an inglorious route in a time of tumultuous, you know, in a tumultuous media landscape in the middle of buyouts and layoffs. I graduated right after the recession, which is a time very much like now where there were no jobs and everybody was on a hiring freeze. Um, but the reason I got into politics was, you know, Donald Trump ran for office. You know, he, 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 he paved his way to the White House calling Mexicans criminals. And I realized like there needs to be more Latinos covering the news. Um, so I, you know, pushed really hard to to get um, to start, start to start covering state politics for the LA Times in California, and then I ended up here two years later. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, is there, I know you guys are focused a lot on national politics, but back here in Massachusetts, is there anything you're watching that might be interesting, or is this going to be kind of a boring, um, boring sort of Massachusetts ballot? Oh man, I think you should answer that one, James. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> there's what's one. What's interesting in Massachusetts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's one like sort of. I mean, it's interesting to see, you know, uh, how big of a margin Joe Biden obviously gets. It, it, I'm sorry, if Joe Biden, two interesting things, two, two interesting things that happen. If Joe Biden becomes president, uh, that is going to be a big deal in Massachusetts because um, of what it means for sort of uh, the chessboard of. Massachusetts politics. Uh, Marty Walsh, for example, in terms of Boston, may join the administration. He may become like, I don't know, an ambassador to Ireland or something. And there's obviously an election for uh, mayor of Boston next year that will now be an open seat. And right now there are two women of color seeking it, which would be the first woman mayor um, in the city's history. So yeah, that could be a huge deal uh, locally if Joe Biden does become president. Maybe even Charlie Baker goes also. There's been some rumors that he may join the cabinet if Joe Biden is elected. Uh, of course, Charlie Baker himself is not taking a position on this presidential election like he didn't last time. Um, I think the second thing that's interesting is a ballot question, which is on ranked choice voting. Um, only Maine, Maine is the only state in the country which has this different system of how you vote. You rank your choices. So. Um, say, for example, you actually liked um, a more liberal candidate or a more conservative candidate or a different kind of candidate, you can vote for that person and not waste your vote. You can vote for that person first and then vote for maybe a more mainstream person second. Um, and then that there's, there's theories if it's good or it's bad, but that would actually be very different um, in terms of how people vote. So I think those are the two sort of big things to, to watch. Sorry to ask you a Massachusetts question. I realized that was a mistake. Um, uh, we have we do have a good question though from uh, let me make sure I get this right a, a teacher um, uh, Linda Garman uh, who asks what do you think is the most important uh, lesson to teach students about the 2020 election I guess you could take that pre game or post game of the election anyone want to throw in there interesting I mean I think one thing that's been nice about um, the fact that there haven't been a lot of traditional campaign events this time around. Um, I mean, the president is back on the rallies, but for a while there was almost nothing on either 
side really. And, and there's no like campaign trail, like typically there is for us reporters where we just like glom on to these giant events and like, you know, we're moving like an amoeba next to the candidate with our microphone out. And um, <clears throat> I think one thing that's been nice is it's resulted in a lot of coverage about the process itself. Um, yeah. which is like something we did. Um, me and Jasmine worked on a project about uh, just like how people are actually gonna vote. And we looked at like voter suppression and you know what election officials are doing to prepare for this massive influx of um, mail-in ballots and just, and the legal battle and just questions about, you know, kind of holding the country up to the ideal that everyone's supposed to get to vote. Um, and it's not okay for people to worry that their vote's not going to count or for people to worry that they might face a line where they can't vote. Like, that's just ridiculous. Like, we're a democracy. And I think it's been good that this, um, this election has put a focus on that. And um, because, and in a way, like, it, in some states, it's easier to vote because of the pandemic. Like, vote by mail enfranchises people. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's a really good thing that now more people can vote more uh, easily. Um, so that's, that's something to talk about, I think, with kids. I think another thing is just to talk about some of the strains on our actual society right now. Because um, I think it's just important for people to be, you know, aware of like, just cross currents, like it's not normal to see political violence, right? Like it's not, we haven't seen that in a while where it's like different demonstrations are clashing and people are, you know, like the, in Portland, the kid who like shot the other guy and then the one political party is holding that kid up as a hero. Um, and the message is kind of like, it's okay to go out and shoot these protesters. Like that's a really um, intense situation that I think it's good to be aware of and and to um, be looking at how different parties are framing like acts of violence like that because um, that's just dangerous I think. Yeah acts of violence but also values like how you know how we define progress progress for women for LGBTQ for uh, you know, members of the LGBTQ community like um, and again race, like how we cover race, how we talk about racism in schools, like are we teaching people what what equal justice really means, you know, I think that 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 I think should be ongoing conversations and I feel like are going to keep people motivated, um, especially young people motivated and wanting to participate in the political process, hopefully for years to come. Yeah, I do think there's a sort of an inside and outside argument to be made well, on the inside. Um, I think every American is going through their own version of schoolhouse rock on <laughs> how exactly our election works. And someone made the point, uh, I think this morning, that um, election security and the process of election, which is not issues, it's not healthcare, you know, it's not taxes, it's not, you know, anything, the just process of, you know, mail in balloting, uh, someone catching on fire in Boston. Uh, but uh, you know, just, uh, who gets to vote and how quickly do you get to turn it in? Voter suppression, you know, there's a really uh, damning report uh, earlier this week that showed there, from, I think it was from the 2016 election to now, 21,000 polling places have been taken away. Um, from Vice News, I think did that. Uh, just the mere process is the biggest political story uh, of, of, you know, this, this, the cycle, uh, it's not even COVID it's in terms of actual politics. Um, so learning that I think is very, very interesting. You, every cycle you have like, Oh, this is the most important election. I wish more people cared. People care. <laughs> and now the next level is caring about process. I think that's the first part. It's sort of insidery. The second one is outside, which is, uh, particularly here in Massachusetts, uh, we had, I think we have a good sense of how things are going to go in the presidential race and the Senate race and every incumbent is going to win uh, for Congress. However, change, particularly in the last, during this administration, during the, during the last four years, uh, change has been in the streets and it's been very active and it's been very outside the mainstream system to push more change. So what does it mean to be involved in politics? You know, when I was growing up, it meant, you know, volunteering for a campaign or going door to door or being a nerd. 
And now it's about, you know, catching on, a, like as Jasmine was saying, values and, and um, whatever they are and being active about it. Uh, because uh, working through the traditional funnel of system um, isn't as prevalent now. We have tools that, you know, social media, we've got, uh, we've got a lot of energy in the streets. And so there's an inside of how this whole process works and then how does this process be pushed uh, from the energy from the outside that is particularly being led by young people uh, that I think is particularly inspiring for old folks like myself. Um, I think it, oh, oh, Good. Yep. Oh no, I was just going to add like that. That also, it's 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 uh, increasingly becoming global because of the internet. Like a lot of these conversations, these cross currents that we're talking about, like yeah. you know, older generation feeling the heterosexual, the the new nuclear heterosexual family under attack. Like that's happened for a long time here in the United States. It's happening in Latin America, and these groups are increasingly using common language. And you're seeing that a little bit on uh, this, this on the right, you're seeing this a little bit on the left, but not as, as, as robust as and organized and coordinated as it has been. And I'm wondering whether because of this election, because of the disinformation campaigns we've seen in 2016 and, and now whether we're gonna start to see a rise on, on, that, on that other end in, in movement. Mm -hmm. And certainly on, on the left, these there's more organizations that are that existed now than ever existed, even especially during Hillary's election. Um, I want to thank Liz, Jasmine, um, uh, and I want to thank the Nellie May Foundation for this. Uh, you, this is obviously being recorded. Other people will be able to watch it later, and that's you. And you're watching it later. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you for your questions. This is a lot of fun, and hopefully we'll have a good, safe. Um, and maybe even fun election a week from today. I'm James Fender from The Globe, and on behalf of The Globe and the Nightmare Foundation, thanks so much for watching. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And James, may the universe hear you in having a, an election that's a little bit safe. Um, I want to thank all of our participants, especially the young people who submitted questions for this robust conversation today. Thank you, Jasmine. Liz and James for lifting up and centering the questions of our young people in this conversation. There are so many dynamics and complexities at play. Um, Jasmine, Liz and James referenced some stats earlier about turnout. And the good news is many reports and polls are showing us that young people in record numbers across states have registered to vote, are voting early or by absentee ballot in the election so far. Uh, our young people understand what's at stake, right? Like their lives and our collective future. And one of my favorite quotes is from James Baldwin who says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Young people are facing the critical nature of this moment because values and rights are at stake. So this November, let's ensure that we keep the needs, the hopes and the demands from our young people front and center. And I want to thank you on behalf of the Nellie May Education Foundation for joining us today. Thank you.